Awesome. So, I am Jill Clapperton. I'm from Rise of Terra. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about, in this case, we're just really going to hit it hard with soil health at the beginning. So the way I see this going is I'm going to talk about, I'm going to review for everybody um, who lives in the soil. So who are the rulers of the underground? And then we're going to talk a lot about what they do. And I'm going to try and give you a lot of practical knowledge of how we can use plants. So the one thing I'll tell you is that I believe plants can solve most of our problems. So we're going to talk a lot about plants and plant roots and, and, the whole, and how they all work together. Um, so I am a rhizosphere ecologist. So what that means is I work on the interaction between plant soils and soil organisms. Um, and so I'm a systems person. So the one thing that I really like about that is that I get to look at how all these things interact together. And one thing I'll tell you is the plant drives it all. Because the most active part of your soil is the rhizosphere where the roots are leaking out all that great food. So we're going to talk about, we're going to start with who lives in the soil and, and how they rule the underground. And then we're going to talk about how to use them. And I, I put on the bottom here, this is mostly from Susan's comment yesterday about democracy. Um, sometimes it's democracy, but sometimes the plants really rule. And it's, um, it's a dictatorship. Okay, so if you've seen YouTube videos or you've heard me talk, then you know I'm going to always bring this up. Because I want to show people that biology is really at the top of the pyramid of all of this. So it's biology that unites the chemical and the physical properties of the soil. And it's what drives soil productivity. And oftentimes, when we talk about soil productivity, we're talking about yield. And I know it's a bit different in the organic community because people are really talking about food. But I work in a lot with a lot of really large-scale farmers that are what I call the new conventional um, because they're not really using a lot of chemicals, but they are doing a lot of really interesting things. And although many of them will talk about yield and not about the fact, what is our food quality? How good is this stuff that we're eating? What is, and, and if we put everything into the food, we don't have to worry about environmental quality. Because we're putting all our nutrients right into the food. And ultimately, that's going to benefit our health and the health of our animals. So that's the idea here. We're, we're going to work off this model. So you know, I'm just asking you to just sort of think about that just a little bit as we go forward. If you build it, well, if you're doing this, like in Wyoming, um, where they're planting sugar beets, and this was taken in January, um, everything's homeless. And we're really, you know, we talk about regenerative agriculture. That is in desperate need of regenerative agriculture. And we come down here, and in this case, we're seeding corn directly into a cover crop as it's green. Now we're starting to talk about soil biology and the living soil. Above ground diversity does mirror below ground diversity in a way. So above ground diversity is very limited. We know that below ground diversity is thousands of times better than it is above ground. So all we have to do is little changes in above ground diversity and we can start to really push the below ground diversity and push the functions that we have in the soil. So even growing two crops together, like what we have in the other chickpeas and flax growing together. And I am going to talk a lot about polyculture. So again, how to use plants. Um, cover crops, forage crops, yes, we're going to do all of that. Because of the diversity of roots. Look at the diversity of root systems. You'll see in a lot of times I'm growing a lot of fava beans. I love fava beans. Fava beans, fava beans, bell beans, horse beans, whatever you want to call them. Um, but I also love woolly pod vetch because woolly pod vetch does not have any problems with insects. Um, and it's really not disease but you can see we have all these diverse root systems. So it's not just about diversity, diverse root systems. Let's use the root systems too. So I like to think about below ground canopies as opposed to above ground canopies. The soil is a habitat, a game. The most important thing is, is that all the animals, all the things that live in the soil, plants included, have this tremendous capacity 
to modify the soil structure. Plants can do it. They'll change the root aggregates. You'll get bigger aggregates, smaller aggregates. You've noticed it, anybody who's gardening. You get beans. Soil is mellow, it smells beautiful. And then you grow something like alfalfa and the whole thing is like tight and, and the aggregates are small. That is the effect of the plant on the soil. And yes, that does affect all the microbial community around it at the same time. So it's, you build it, they will come. I love this. Um, at the Lethbridge Research Center in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada, we had, uh, we do have still, um, long-term no-till plots. And one handful of soil, and look at the thousands and thousands of arthropod, microarthropods that you have in a handful of soil. This is a handful of soil. You think your soil's not alive. We only need a dissecting scope. And we can look at it 50 to 100 times, and all of a sudden, the world opens up to us. And now we have digital scopes and things like that, so we can really, really have a good look. Soil your undies. <laughs> um, this is an absolutely fun, but very effective tool. I know it doesn't sound like it would be, but um, a long time ago, it was called the cotton strip test. And it came from England, and there was a mill in England where they would make the same cotton and they would, and they would, act, they would weave it exactly the same way, it would come from the same source. And you would buy these strips and you would buy this little tensiometer and you would clip the strip on one end and you would pull it on the other end and it would give you a reading. And if the reading was very low, um, then it meant it didn't take much effort to break it, it meant that you had better decomposition. So this is a, a, a new twist on the old test using cotton underwear. Um, I will tell you that it's better to use men's underwear than women's because women's actually does have quite a bit of nylon in it. Um, and so it, it, although it goes very see-through and transparent at the end, um, these ones actually disintegrate. So the way you do this test, and it can actually, I've written up instructions that are on my website for how to do this very scientifically because you can wash them and you can wash them again and weigh them. Um, we also, if you look at, you know, our new science, open open source um, science, you can also use the um, image analysis tool to take a picture of your disintegrated undies and know what your rate of decomposition is. So this is um, an excellent tool. It's fun. Kids love it. Field days, it's great. Um, there's a lot of farmers around North America doing this test. Uh, this is the German National Field Day. Um, you can see the umbrellas. That's how deep this soil pit was. Um, and in this soil pit, you can see we're looking at the roots even into the, to the second horizon. The idea here is to actually look at a root canopy. And when you go to field days, or you're looking at seed growers, or somebody's trying to sell you cover crop seeds, or whatever, you want to ask them about, well, show me your roots. Let me see what's going on in there. Uh, I love, I mean, I really like every second year I do go to the German National Field Day because every variety of every crop, including all the cover crop seeds, and, and that are in plots like this, and they all have these soil trenches behind them that you can walk into and actually look at the roots or, or hear them growing. <laughs> now we're going to talk about, now we've talked a little bit about, well, yes, the plants live there. Plants, the most biologically active part of your soil is the roots in the root area. So we have the bacteria. I hear a lot of people here talking about microbes. Microbes are really important, but what are microbes really important for? They are primary producers. They are the food for the guys that really recycle. So everybody thinks, well, I, I really need to, you know, keep my microbes happy. Yes, you do, because they're the primary producers. But we're going to talk about all those guys that you saw, those microarthropods. They're what drive nutrient recycling. If we don't have predators and we don't have things eating other things, then we have a problem. And it's called nitrogen immobilization. And if you get a lot of bacteria and fungi and you have no predators, well, we have a New Zealander. What happens with rabbits? 
<laughs> they multiply. And then they're really good microbes because they can have a whole new generation in 24 hours are really good at taking your nutrients away from your plants. And if you're not recycling them with predators, then we have a problem because now we have this like trovial activity and they're using all the nutrients from our plants and we're not eating. This is a soil structure problem. We can solve it, but we can also solve that with plants as well. So we'll get on that. Mycorrhizal fungi. So we get into fungi. We've talked about bacteria and fungi. I'm going to talk a lot about mycorrhizal fungi because mycorrhizal fungi, for me, epitomize the rises here. They can't live without a plant host. They create the soil structure and they change the rhizosphere because they, because of their activities, they actually change what leaks out of the plant roots, which means that we have a much more plant-friendly rhizosphere, which is not unselfish on their part. It's very selfish because if you can't live with a host, what are you going to do? You're going to flood the root zone with things that protect your host so that you can survive because you need your host to survive. So if we think about it that way, it's all about survival there. Um, this is a mycorrhiza living inside the cell roots. Um, mycorrhiza do amazing things. They confer drought resistance, disease resistance. They bring nutrients that are very hard to get to the plant. They link all the plants together in the row so that they're all talking to one another. We know from ectomycorrhiza studies, which is the mycorrhiza that are on conifers, that we can load one in the, in the forest. So if we talk about in... Um, uh, the, in, in Oregon State, one of the Oregon State professors, what she did is she radioactive labeled one tree and followed where all the radioactivity went and eventually it was 25 kilometers away. That network is big. I mean, talk about a neural network, right? Or, or an internet. Or think about it like fiber optics. Information going fast between trees, going fast between plants. And they're actually building the soil. So they're aggregating the particles together. It's like a big net, right? Like if we look at the hyphae here, the mycelium, it actually forms like a net and then we start to get really big aggregates. And now we're starting to really create soil structure. We're starting to create the habitat. The bacteria start us off because with their metabolism they need things, start to glue a few particles together. Now we start to net them into much bigger aggregates. Now, look at all the air between these spaces. Remember that we're looking at this like 200 times. But we think about everything as being tight. But it's not as tight as you think. This is sand, pure sand, all linked together with mycorrhizal hyphae, gluing all the soil particles together, creating a structure so that the microbes can work around things, so that the plants are all there. We're getting stuff out of, you know, sand, mining the little bit of organic matter that's there. These are spores of mycorrhizal fungi. And you can see in the um, grain only, this is a grain only rotation. In the conventional, this is what the density of the spores looks like. Over here in the organic, you can see it's bigger. Part of it is, is Mycorrhizal fungi are an energetic cost to the plant. So the plant has to fuel them. They don't do all of it for free. They need photosynthate from the plant in order to function. And when they're doing this, when they colonize that plant root, they change the metabolism. That plant all of a sudden goes into high speed photosynthesis. The whole root exudate pattern changes because mycorrhizal fungi don't want just sugars. They want amino acids. They want organic acids. In fact, that, it changes dramatically that way. They change the biochemistry of the plant so that they produce more amino acids, more organic acids, and shift them to the roots. That then changes the pH around the root, changes the community around the root, and the whole community shifts to plant promoting rice bacteria. The Psyllis thuringiensis to protect them from being grazed on. So you can see what's happening here. They're working with the plant 
for themselves, but in doing so, they're protecting their host. We need this whole system to work together. I just give you an idea. The other thing that happens here is that um, phosphorus, and this is what I was getting to, is that plants, the mycorrhiza, because they're an energetic cost, the plant only wants to use them if they have to work hard. So if the mycorrhiza are make it easy for them to get access to nutrients, they go, yeah, come on in. If they've already got loaded with nutrients, they go, no, back off. We don't want you because you're an extra energy cost and I don't need to do that anymore. So the beauty of the systems that we're working in in regenerative ag is that we're using organic sources of nutrients in order to get after this, which means that the plants are working a little bit, they, you know, they're getting fit. And the mycorrhiza are, are working as well with them so that we start to build this system and a partnership. Because mycorrhizas are there to help the plant take over the space so that they can compete better for light and resources. And if they don't need any of that, then why bother? And it's the same for rhizobium, by the way. Legumes will be really lazy and won't form a nodule if you give them too much nitrogen. Why should I bother? I got it all here. I don't need the energetic cost. <coughs> I want to see stuff like this. When you start seeing <coughs> mushrooms growing in your field, you know you have arrived. <laughs> you know that your organic matter is at the point where you can really, that your system is really thriving. Because when they start to form fruiting bodies, it means that they have enough energy to actually go after reproduction. Right? So we need to think about this as an energy pattern, right? This is all about energy. So if I have enough energy, I can do these things. If I don't, then I have to kind of pull my horns in and, and, and take a moment. I love this. So this is actually mycorrhizal fungi mining an alfalfa root. And notice how these roots are really super yellow. Like really yellow, like almost canary yellow. Most, what most people don't know is that mycorrhizal fungi in, more, in, in certain plants will actually form a yellow color, a beta carotene color, that actually they exude from the root. It's water soluble, so it doesn't last very long. But when you see it, you know you have mycorrhiza, so you don't have to stain or anything. You just go, oh, I have mycorrhiza. And they are actually mining this. So that's the other thing that happens. When you start to see a lot of lateral roots, and they're all in one area, or they're, you know, and all of a sudden there's been this huge proliferation of roots, it means they're mining. It means they're in a resource patch and everybody's mining. And again, plants will not form lateral roots if there's not enough energy and it's not worth their while to build them. They'll just keep pushing their energy into going into offshoots until they find a resource patch and then they'll mine it. And invariably, those resource patches have a lot to do with organic matter. And that's why those old rootstocks are so important. That's why root canopies are important. And they're important for these guys. These are your predators. Your protozoa are massive predators, but they can't move anywhere if you have bad soil structure. They don't go anywhere. They can't move around. They move on water films. And they zoom around, and then they find the bacteria, and then they eat them up. Nematodes, too. Most people, when they think about nematodes, are thinking, parasitic nematodes, but no, most of the nematodes are really important. How many of you know that we have insect parasitizing nematodes? Okay, we have a number of them. This is important, folks, because plants are sending signals. And they go, hey, buddy, get over here. I need your help. Get after these insects. Plants are sending those signals. And if we create the habitat, and we have these things in it, then what's going to happen? We are going to have those resources at our fingertips, and the plants are. And they're going to send this gaseous signal out, and all of a sudden, they're going to swarm and end of insect problem. So gang, create the habitat, and let's go. This is the one, I have to show this one, because every this is, this is the Vogue mite being on the cover of a lot of farm magazines, um, and is in the new Soils um, book by Ray Weil. Um, this is a columbulin. So anytime you see leaves, 
you know, you see the leaves, and they're like really lacy looking. These little guys have had at it. They've eaten everything out of in between. And, and as they've been eating everything out of in between, they've nicked some of the woodier material, and then the fungi can come in. So fungi and these animals are working together. Fungi need to get, are going to break down all the woody stuff. And in fact, if we don't have fungi, we are not breaking down wood and the really woody residues. But they also need these animals to nick the surface so they can get in and really work at it. And the beauty of it is, is that most of the microarthropods love to eat fungal colonized material. So you see the symbiosis and the synergy going together. It's a cascading effect. Earthworms. Um, just for anybody who hasn't seen earthworm sex, <laughs> just you know, keep your interest peaked for a bit. That was after lunch. Um, the result of earthworm sex. Here we are, a cocoon. They can look like popcorn seeds, a little smaller, depending on the species. Earthworms are really ecosystem engineers because when we have earthworms, we have big pores, we have a lot of aeration, we have a lot of water infiltration. They will single-handedly, a group of earthworms will change your water infiltration enormously. So we want to have earthworms. For me, um, I think that earthworms are one of the great indicators of soil quality. So people always ask me, well, how can I measure? Like, I have to send them off to the lab, and yes, you saw I have lab equipment. Honestly, put a spade in the ground in the early spring, uh, put it in in the fall when, after you've had a rainstorm or it was wet, or just even under the snow. They love it when it's cold and wet because the cold moisture carries more oxygen, so why not get active when there's more oxygen? Put a spade in the ground, <coughs> flip it over. If you can count, more than 10 earthworms do the happy dance. Um, if you are counting less than that, go, need to work on it. If you can barely find one, get the book on regenerative egg, because you need it. <laughs> this is what they look like when they're sleeping. I went this in because, um, for those of you in the grazing world, Neil Dennis died not that long ago. Neil um, was from Saskatchewan, and Neil was uh, a disciple of Terry Gompert, and in the, the um, sort of one of the first mob grazers, really successful mob grazers. And so this is a tribute to Neil. And if you knew Neil, you couldn't miss Neil. He looked like the human version of Yosemite Sam. So you would know if you knew him. Um, and healthy soils, plants are thriving. So here's another thing. How many, I mean, we're farmers. As a farmer, when you walk out into the field, you can sense when things are wrong, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, you go out in the field and you go, something's not right. Well, okay, start there and allow yourself to say, something's not right. And then start looking. Or, better yet, allow yourself to, to just go, I know that something's not right. And then, most amazingly, usually it comes to you, yeah. exactly what is wrong. So allow your intuition to work. Give yourself permission to use intuition. Um, Diversity of organisms, now we're getting into the, the next big structure. We're going to talk a lot about what characterizes a, hap, a healthy soil. And I have to tell you it's structure. So the first thing that we need to work on is structure. Organic matter is a big part of having structure. And it should look like this. OK, when I talk about an infrastru infrastructure, soil infrastructure, look at that. It looks like a map of a city in Europe. That's what your soil should look like. When you take a slice, when you run it through a CAT scan, and yes, there are some of those of us that have run soils through CAT scans. Um, we, we were in Saskatchewan, and um, actually the University of Saskatchewan at one point owned part of the CAT scan for the hospital. And so at night, the grad students would run in there and be running soils. 
through the CAT scan until there was an emergency. And then it was like, you guys got to clean up. We need to use it. You know, and you'd be cleaning up so that nobody could see that there was soil all over the floor and things like that. I mean, I, I'm sure they wouldn't allow that now. But I think, actually, it may have been healthier than it is now. <laughs> you know? Um, so this is, so when I said that, when we think about our model, and I said biology unites the chemical and the physical, this is columbula poop. And you can see it's creating its own habitat. The microbes are feeding on the manure. They're creating the structure. And then look at all the air between everything. So now we've got more structure again. We're lightening it up. We're loosening it up. We're getting air in there, water infiltration. And think about how our little protozoa can move all over and gobble up all those bacteria and fungi so that we don't have to worry about our plants starving. And then look at all the room in here. Now, remember, you're a microbe. This may not look like a lot of room, but if you're a microbe, this is like super highway stuff. I can move around there really fast. I can get at the bacteria. I can, you know, and plants are going to create this. Bacteria are going to create it. We're all, they're all in that together. Now, this comes back to the point I was making about plants using a lot of, not using energy unless they really can. If you look at the structure of this plant, the soil structure here, look what's in there. Look at all the lateral roots. It's mining that soil because it can. It has access to a lot more nooks and crannies. It has access to a lot more organic matter. This guy is struggling. All the energy is to push it down, bust it open, try and get nutrients. When your soil is not well structured, you, the plant is using way too much energy to grow really well. And we don't want that. We want them to grow really well. And we want that soil to look like that. So when you take the soil and you crush it in your hand and then let it open, it should just come out in cookie crumbs again. And then you know that you've got great structure. More of these great animals. I love them. Um, these are all orbatted mites. They were, the pictures were taken with scanning electron micro microscopy. Um, most of these are magnified um, up to 50,000 times their size because 14 of them would fit on the head of a pin. So you get the close up and impersonal, in person look at them. Um, we changed a little bit about the organic matter. Um, mostly that's because of working with Gabe Brown. Um, we struggled with organic matter keeping cover on the ground um, when we were at 30 to 1. So we had to start growing more cereals in the mixes so that we could maintain cover, so that the soil wasn't bare anymore. And that was really, really important to us. We didn't want bare soil. So um, we changed. And, and I, I, I was in Germany, and there was one composter. And he's like, that is not right. I don't like that. And, but it was like, I'm not talking about compost. I'm talking about on the ground recycling. And I need cover on the ground all the time. I need to have my insulation on there. I need to have habitat for spiders and predators and things like that. And I can't do that if I don't have residues on the ground. All right. So we've all had lunch. So this is a little test. What do we got there? What's happening? And I am going to stand here until somebody says something. <laughs> yeah, it could be sand. Loss of topsoil, dry. dry, yep, it is. Um, all of those are right. Um, this is in the Palouse in Washington State where I am. And we have a lot of eroded knolls. And on those eroded knolls, we don't grow anything. Crop grows really well in between because there's no organic matter, because there's no topsoil anymore. So we started amending it with pelleted compost. Why did I pellet it? Because on eight and 10,000 acres. I can stick it in the drill. I can run it with my crop. And I can cover acres. And, and then I am putting organic matter in the ground where it belongs. And then I start to build it. Now, my whole philosophy is I will help you get over the hump of, re, of starting the recovery process. But then it's up to you. Once, if you identify a problem, then let's solve your problem. Let's not just put a Band-Aid on it, OK? So this is a Band-Aid. Now we need to create crop rotation and do all these other things that are going to make it better. And where does all this organic matter come from? Well, photosynthesis. And we just have to remember photosynthesis is at the, 
at, at the forefront of all of this. Why do mycorrhizae improve photosynthesis? Because they need the plant to be really active. That is a really important part of this. And why are we picking different plants? Because warm season and cold season plants have different kinds of photosynthesis, and some of them are more effective than others. So that's why we blend plants. So you can see green areas, really super green areas in there, little like strips of them. Um, this is a plot that's been going on now for more than 20 years. We grow continuous wheat in it, but 20 years ago it had alfalfa. And the idea here is, and this scientists do weird things sometimes, is how long will it take to mine all the nitrogen out of that organic matter from the alfalfa? And we are still going. <laughs> so I think that we're actually going to give up. Um, it's more, almost 25 years now, and so it's like, OK, um, we know that it lasts at least 25 years. Uh, we can move on. Yes? It actually, in our case, it is unorganic matter. I've spent a lot of time looking for free-living nitrogen fixers and things like that on cereals in our climate, and we have not found them. Um, and we've done, some, we've found some really interesting things, but um, no, this this is actually mining organic matter, and it's pretty cool um, because a long time ago they also buried N15 in there. Nitro an isotope of nitrogen so that we could actually track it and it is coming from the alfalfa. So it's very cool. Wow. So um, one of the things I want to talk, I, I also, you see this is again, I'm reiterating it, but everybody talks about sugars. I want to make sure that you understand that the back carbon backbones of sugar are also in amino acids, also in lipids, also in organic acids, also in nucleic acids. So it's not just about sugars, folks. It's about everything. Um, now, so, so all of a sudden it goes, what? Selenium? Humans? What? When we get into the next section, I'm going to talk to you about how we use plants. But you need to understand that how we use plants is based on a purpose. So I've chosen selenium in this case because I've just been working on selenium deficiency uh, copper and selenium deficiency in pastures and cattle. Um, but this is an important problem. Selenium is also a really big part of metalloproteins that control iron metabolism. And we've been doing a lot of work on that. I have two graduate students at um, Brigham Young University that are working on this right now. Um, but why I bring it up is because well, how can we use plants to solve this problem? How can we use plants to solve this problem? Well, there are plants that are hyperaccumulators. <laughs> Brassicas actually accumulate a lot of selenium if it's there. So in our cover crops, we need to be selecting for plants that we can actually use. If we have a selenium problem and we can eat all of these plants, we can eat, the, we can eat some astragalus species. Um, this one's salt bush. The other one is Prince's Plume. We can eat, uh, the cattle can eat some of these as long as they're mixed with other things. We have soils in the United States and Canada that are high in selenium. And actually in Europe, they're paying a premium to buy the grains from those soils so they can blend that wheat with the other wheat to create high selenium bread. We could do that too. So this is all about the rhizosphere right now. So how are we going to use plants? How do we pick? That's the other thing. When I'm doing cover crop work, people go, well, why did you pick that? How do I know how to pick this? One of the first things I start with people when, I'm asking, when they're asking me that is, what's the problem? What is the key problem that you are trying to solve? Then let's talk about how we do plants. Let's pick, think about the plants that we're going to pick. I have an insect problem in my greenhouse, in my hoop house. Well, OK. So what plants could I step on every day in between the rows that would give off essential oils that would repel them? <coughs> Time, yes. I can use some of those things, those ground covers, walk on them every day. Then I don't have soil. I, I have, don't have the same physma problems. I got some other things happening. I can do that. 
Nitrogen is one of the key things that a lot of people are growing, and if you're an organic farmer, you need to grow your nitrogen. You get at, so I'm going to ask you a question. How much nitrogen do you get after, after a thunderstorm in the rain? You get one kilo of nitrogen for every millimeter of water. How many, and, and if you think about that, there's 20, 250 millimeters in an inch. As nitrate? As, nit as nitrates, yes. So imagine that. Do you know in Minnesota, farmers used to count on it. They actually, if they didn't get enough rainstorms, enough thunderstorms, they would go, oh, the corn's going to be bad this year. Because they knew that. That's, that's you know, contextual knowledge that we knew a long time ago. Some of us are our heritage. But some of it is, when we're picking covers, I'm looking at this chart. This was done by John Pate from Australia in 1972. Um, and this is the nitrogen root exudates from these plants. And what's really cool about this is that this is nitrate. These are amino acids, these are amides, and these are oreides here, which are really complicated nitrogen molecules. What's really cool is that beans and peas. So I looked at this and went, OK, I don't want plants that are going to use a lot of nitrate. I want them to be exuding a lot more amino acids because it's going to last longer in my soil. I'm not going to leach it. I'm going into organic form. So I start there. Now, the one thing, if you have wild oats, what this also tells you, you have wild oats, you have a nitrogen problem. You've got a lot of available nitrogen. So if you thought you didn't have any and you've got fields of wild oats, you still have available nitrogen because they need it. White clover, I don't put a lot of white clovers in with plants that need a lot of nitrogen because they also use a lot of nitrogen. So I don't want them competing. In grasslands, one of the things I say is you look at this and you go, well, what, what happened here? We need legumes in our mixes. Organic farmers have known that for a long time. They're growing nitrogen. They know that they need legumes in the mix. So, but we also know that, that when we put legumes in the mix, we cycle more carbon. We have higher photosynthetic rates. See, I want to show you that these things all go together. You start it, and it all starts cascading. So these are, here we are, linking all these plants together. All the different roots. This is mycorrhizal hyphae, and they're just going from one to the other. And you go, oh, you did a lot of this. Here, let me have this. You did, oh, let's move it around here. And, you know, all of a sudden, your crop starts looking really uniform. And it's all the underground stuff that's networking everybody and shifting all the nutrients around. Plant species have unique adaptions. Buckwheat, for example, will exude a lot of acids. It's a phosphorus, calcium, and magnesium accumulator. It does great things. Lupins produce a whole bunch of roots. Um, they're called um, uh, no, I'm, I'm cluster roots. And they'll just pump out acids when they don't get phosphorus. People ask, they say, well, what about your soil test? Um, it doesn't say plant availability. Plants make what is available. Your job is to make sure whatever they need is in the ground, that they have access to it, because they will work on it themselves. And here's an example. So what we have here, um, A is a soybean. B is May is, um, no, A is the faba bean. This is the soybean. And this one here is corn. And you can see the different pH of the root exudates. That's what we're using when we build these things. We're trying to build, and when we do polyculture, we're taking advantage of the plant, innate plant capability and using it to benefit our cash crops, or using it because it fixes more nitrogen, or it releases more phosphorus. And the whole point about doing this is that I'm putting these mineral nutrients into an organic form that can be broken down by my microbes and made available to my plants to use more efficiently and effectively. So I want to increase the amount of carbon that's exuded from roots. Well, I can do that by just making sure that I'm using organic nitrogen, which you're all doing if you're an organic farmer. I'm using plants to optimize the ecosystem, onions. What's that? Allicin, sweet allicin. Thrips are a problem. Lightest bugs are a problem. I need beneficial insects. Let's surround the field with flowers. Let's put them in between. 
and let's grow really great onions. Uh, targeted uses of pest control. Mixes of mustards to target nematodes. Um, and that is not dust coming off the back of that. That is actually mustard gas. And, well, when I start using mixes of plants, I don't use as much water. Look at this. This is soybeans. Same period of time. Look at them draw down. Now look at how many species I have in there. And this is my water use at the same time in the same soil. Putting plants together. If I'm in a dry climate, think about climate change right now. If I'm in a dry climate, I need to grow things together. I need to increase the intensity. Now, historically speaking, the Chinese were using intercropping all the time. I mean, they had no problem doing the Iroquois and our native people and, and in Central America were all using the Three Sisters. They were intercropping. Um, in the late 1800s, we actually were putting clover under corn and going, oh, man, you should see our increased yield. In Canada, we showed repeatedly that after, if we used a mixed forage crop and then grew wheat, we got a 10% yield. And this was before fertilizers. So we knew these things. <laughs> what is old is new again. This is from 1555, a monastery in Denmark. They were growing things together. <coughs> so what is mixed species cropping? This is winter triticale with buckwheat. Growing together, harvested together. Seed cleaning is, becomes a big part of your life, but um, <laughs> yeah, like a really big part. But the cool thing is, is it results in higher yields than if you grow one by themselves. It's called overyielding or outyielding. And the most amazing thing is, is that when we pick it right, and I'm not going to tell you, sometimes 1 plus 1 equals 2, but sometimes 1 plus 1 can equal 4, 6, or 8 if we pick correctly. And so what we've been doing is, like, how do they share? Do we pick things that share? Can we pick things that share the mycorrhizae that really like each other? So this is how it works. Flax, we mix flax with sorghum. And all of a sudden, we get a 46% increase in yield in the flax. Sorghum's not as good, but the flax is higher. They're sharing. Here's our mycorrhizal network. And all of a sudden, I've got spores. I've got things going on. I've got a different source of carbon. They're sharing carbon. Mycorrhizal network's growing. This is the kind of thing that we want to really think about. Intermingling of roots. And again, did anybody notice? Look at these really super yellow roots in here. Maize roots with vetch. No, that's a, that looks like, is it vetch or daikon? Is there a daikon in there? Uh, there's vetch, um, there, yeah, up here. That's actually a vetch root there, too. Oh, okay. So yeah. they are a mycorrhizal plant. Have you seen it in non-mycorrhizal plants as well? Um, no. No, not really. No. You, don't, you won't get the yellow color because that truly is a mycorrhizal function. I'm going to do that. So I have to throw some data in here. Um, but what I want you to see is that if you have good soil structure, the roots will proliferate more. They'll interact more. We'll get more sharing, and everybody will grow better. That's essentially what that says. So when we pick companions or when we're relay cropping, we don't want things that exactly exploit the same root zone. What we're trying to do is exploit the whole soil profile, but not actually exploit the same zone so that the two plants are competing against each other. We want them to be around each other, but not trying to compete with one another. So I, I, we're trying to create a synergistic consortium of things. Um, this is Derek Axton, the Ax Derek, a Derek and Tannic. Tannis Axton's farm in Saskatchewan. Um, Derek, when he discovered polyculture in 2011, he went crazy on it. And um, they don't have anything in single, single species in the field. Everything is mixed together. And they've been experimenting with all these things and how they grow them together. 
Um, they're still struggling with getting more than two plant, two cash crops, but they're working on it. This is all you need. You just need seed. It's all the inputs. Um, you can seed it in different directions. This is um, Jim Robb out of Kansas, southern Kansas. And he does the same thing. He just seeds them in different places. And he, what, he is one of my new conventional farmers. Um, you can see he said, oh, I didn't need any herbicide. I like, can change the way I'm doing things now. Um, brassic is a piece. This is actually harvesting them here, harvesting them together. Here's the canola already. You can see it ready in there. And the peas are in there. And they're all ripening together. That's the other key. You have to have them ripening together. And then that's what it looks like at harvest. And then you're obviously you're trying to pick seeds that are small and seeds that are big that you can actually separate. That's the other key part about that. Um, the other cool thing is that we can make more phosphorus available because now we have plants that really like can make the phosphorus available. The other one that can take it up, share. Now, one thing that you mentioned about mycorrhiza, you'll notice that canola is not mycorrhizal, but the peas are. That's the other cool thing is now I'm building the inoculum density in my soil of mycorrhiza, but I'm still growing a non-mycorrhizal crop. So I'm supporting my below ground system. So Johnny's run trials with spinach and started inoculating spinach with, you know, chitopods and non-mycorrhizal, yeah. and he sees marked improvement in, you know, after he, he saw it on his trip where um, carrots and spinach were really close together. And, and carrots are mycorrhizal. Right. And so we saw that. I'm just wondering. <coughs> No, they're not being colonized, but the benefits are there. The, the nutrients are still somehow getting in. Well, it leaks. The mycorrhizal hyphae leak as well, just like the roots do. And then you're creating a better, a better microbial community in there. And, and they're, they're, those microbial communities are shared, and they're not antagonistic to one another. Yeah, that's the key. That's the key. Um, Again, this is chickpeas and flax. Um, actually, um, for the most part, we're not using anything. Um, still, uh, and the, the key to all this is, is not to use the kabuli variety, because the kabuli chickpeas, which are the big chickpeas, are really prone to fungal diseases. The desis are wild type. And so wild type means that we are, they're much less prone. They're very mycorrhizal. They are not as prone to disease. So then we don't use anything. I realize I am at an organic conference, but most of the people I work with, I'm trying to build bridges. So I work both sides of the line, but what I'm trying to do is get everybody to meet in the middle so that even my new conventional farmers are not using chemicals, they're not using her, uh, fertilizers, but hopefully we can all learn together. Like we can learn from their polyculture and use it in organics and things like that. So we, we need to build community. Um, this is Lauren Steinluggy. Lauren and Brenda Steinluggy. And Lauren is in the peer group with Derek, and he's like, well, should be able to do something. So he grew soybeans and buckwheat together. And they, lo and behold, they out yielded each other. Um, and he had a bumper crop of both. And this is them ripening together. Um, so, um, faba beans and maize, and we again we had a 20% increase um, in you know the yields. And um, this over yielding is a real thing, and usually it's because of phosphorus and nitrogen and the sharing of nutrients. Um, and now in um, Canada and also in places in Europe, they're actually breeding for intercropping. So now we're starting to to really get into it. Um, and here we are harvesting again. Chickpeas and flax, or sorry, wheat and lentils. And uh, there you are. You can see it. There's the wheat. Is that alternate row seeded? Or? Yeah, alternate row seeded. Um, actually, we changed. Most of the farmers I work with have changed, and now they just throw everything in together. And, but at first, it was alternate row seeding. Because it was, there's a transition. And I thank you for that. It, it, the transition is the most important part of everything. How do we make the transition? We make the transition to not tilling so much. We make the transition to organics. We make a transition to polyculture. 
when we, the transition time is the most critical time where everybody needs support because it's something new. So it, you see it in alternate rows because you know what pure stands look like. And then after that, it's like, you, you'll hear parents talk about, well, the first one I, the first child I had, oh, I just worried like, and then I had a second one, it was like, ah, well, you're okay. Third one's like, yeah, you'll be fine. Um, and it's a bit like that. Once you take the step, and I, I liken it to Indiana Jones where he steps off not knowing if the bridge is really there but believing it's there. He steps off. That's what you're doing when you make the transition. You're stepping off into the unknown and hoping that there's a net there that's going to catch you and you're going to figure this out and you're going to know how to do it. But the good news is that there's all sorts of people out there that have done it and they're willing to share. Um, this is actually an experiment where we split the roots, labeled them with N15, and then looked at the distribution of what was going on and, and how when you grow plants with each other, what, what they do or how much nitrogen they use or where, how they get their nitrogen. And you can see that legumes contribute up to 15% of the N in an intercrop cereal. So when you hear people say, oh, yeah, you don't get any benefit from all that, you have to wait for two years and then it's available. No, grow them together then they're sharing at the same time. And there's no allele package. They're germinating at the same time. There's no allele. That's the picking part. <laughs> there can be allelopathic pro problems. But if we pick right, and a lot of these things are done now. Um, the University of Manitoba did a lot of this work a long time ago. Um, I'm mining really ancient literature. I mean, people laugh at me when I go into the library because I'm looking for old papers. Like, because they did all this stuff. I'm like, well, why should I reinvent the wheel? I can just sit here and read really cool stuff um, and, and not go and reinvent it all. Um, so look, barley getting 19% of its nitrogen when it's intercropped with the peas. Um, we know that this stuff works. Same with the phosphorus. I showed you the phosphorus. I'm not going to let the grazers out. I always have something about grazing because grazing is so important. And I am all about integrated livestock grazing. Um, uh, that, in that case, it was Austrian winter pea. Yeah. In this case, we're pasture stitching or over sowing, whatever you want to call it. We call it stitching because we just are headed into the field. Oh, I missed out on that. Um, anyways, we, we're just taking existing pastures and then we put other species in them, so annual species mostly, and we're trying to build the nutrition of the cattle, but we're also what I'm doing is most of the pastures end up being mostly ryegrass, especially in dairies or whatever. They're mostly, you know, just grass species and it's one species. <laughs> so I believe in, um, the ecolo in, in ecological disturbance or disper disper um, disturbance hypothesis as a way of waking up productivity. And one of the ways I do that is by putting in other plant species and they have to compete all of a sudden and they're like, wow. What's this? Somebody new in the community. And it slaps them out of their apathetic existence and gets them going. Is that a grain using? Yep. And, and I'll tell you that um, a lot of conservation districts now have drills. You would have to clean it out pretty well. But um, you, if you get it first to clean it out and then let all the conventional people use it later. Um, and they're not expensive to rent. And they're not expensive to rent. That's correct. And encourage them to make sure they get a disc drill because you can go through things with a disc much better than if you're pulling, like trying to pull a tine or something like that and raking everything up. But if you can just seed right in, it's, beauty. it's a thing of beauty. Have you tried other ways if uh, the missionary is not enough? Yeah, it, um, yeah. <laughs> I have a sat on the back of a half ton truck and, you know, just throwing it out. Um, the other thing you can do is you can put a Velmar on the front of the tractor, like a, a spreader on the front of your tractor and then pull like a bunch of chains behind. But put it on the front. Don't put it on the back. Put it on the front. Run over it with the tires, all of that. Push it in and, and then try and pack it. You can even put a packer on behind if you want. Well, I've, and, tried, I've tried actually broadcasting and then when my animals are just leaving the pastures, there's some trampling effect right before they're exactly. done. And, you can, and with some things, if you're interested in perennial um, crop, like if you're interested in sice or milk fetch or some of these things that are, have a lot of hard seed content and whatnot, what you can do is feed them. So just put it in their feed and then let them poop it out, wow. all scarified. I mean, it makes the pasture a little patchy, but it works. 
Um, this is, I want to show you nematodes because um, we stitch um, in South Africa. This is with um, my business partner in South Africa, Francis Yatman. Um, we stitch multi-species pastures. Um, we use a lot of mustard in them because we're trying to get them to slap out of it. Um, and what I can tell you is that we've changed the diversity of nematodes dramatically. Um, but we're still, if we use incorrect plant species and we have poor irrigation scheduling, we still have a problem. We can use no-till and with the, and with correct species, and all of a sudden we get a total of 300 and, uh, 3,400 nematodes. Most important is the diversity. Now, all of a sudden, I've got back, these are bacteria feeding instead of plant parasites. So I've changed the whole community function with just stitching. And the same here. Now if I'm doing soil health, uh, cover crop, uh, yeah, who would have thought about putting horseradish in a cover crop? But this particular farmer did. Um, and it works. Um, so does watercress and so do a few other things. And look, what's important here is this little red thing. These are predators. Remember we talked about predators really eating up on things and feeding on insects? These are insect predators and all of a sudden, look at this, I change and I've got all these insect predators. I can do this with plants. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about companions because in the Pacific Northwest, we've gone away from cover crops because it's very difficult. We have a very short window, um, but companions work. We can make companions work. It's just the first step to polyculture anyway. So um, I did this. I had a little bet on, and um, I started growing winter canola in Palouse. And, um, but I needed to catch snow, and I needed to you know, keep things on the ground. So I, in the, while my canola was just you know, forming a rosette, I put this other, I, had the, I seeded it into a cover crop or a companion crop. And that, the idea was to have a lot of faba beans in there, so they turn black when they get frozen, and then when the snow gets on, it would start melting, and then that would help my canola. Um, it was a really interesting experiment. Um, my canola that had the companions flowered two weeks later, but yielded exactly the same amount as the other. I lost fewer plants. They overwintered. Um, uh, I did have a few mouse problems, but for the first time in the history of the farm, we had ermine, we had weasels. So, I started creating an ecosystem. All about predator-prey relationships. I started growing chickpeas with wheat. Um, I started doing that to compete with the weeds, but I also wanted them to supply nitrogen to the wheat. This is no fertilizer, no herbicide, no nothing. Um, just a bunch of chickpeas in between um, my wheat plants. I did 14% protein on dark northern spring wheat. And, um, and I yielded the same as the county average, and I had nothing. My only cost was the seed. And you could graze that if you wanted to. And again, I'm just showing how this works. You can see even nitrogen is moving between this whole system. It's not one direction, it's both directions. It's fabulous. This is Chris Teachout in um, southern Iowa. And he did this experiment with Practical Farmers of Iowa where we grew all these different legumes between the corn rows. And uh, this is pigeon pea. I was really impressed. I'll tell you that the pigeon pea was really impressive. Um, and look at the root here. And all the nodules. I mean, it was and growing between the corn rows. Nothing, no fertilizer, no nothing. Just and he did, there's guar. This is guar. This is the mung beans. The mung beans were also impressive. The cow peas were really impressive. Um, and then these are his yields. Um, this was an experiment for practical farmers of Iowa. You can see that we had some problem. You know, the sun hemp was really impressive. Um, and I'll show you the next slide. The corn on the sun hemp was a little smaller, but we had more of them. Um, so don't take that in context. It's not, uh, we had a lot more of these little cobs. 
Um, but this is what it looked like. So you can see that it didn't affect the cobs much at all, having something in between the rows. We're feeding them nitrogen. And what's also impressive is look at the filling. They're filled right up. Do you have a control? For I didn't have a cob for the control, um, but part of it is, is actually this was a comparison study more than having nothing because the, we didn't want to have nothing. So um, that's the other thing when you're working with farmers is it's like, well, why would I do that? I leave my soil open to erosion and stuff. I'm not doing it. Let's do a reference instead. Is it the same density for the three sisters as all the other cops? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All planted the same day. And then this is the results from the um, tracer that we have out there. Um, here's the sun hemp. Let's just look at it for something. Um, this is phosphorus right here. These are soybeans, so we'll just leave the soybeans out right now. Um, what's really interesting is look at both the pigeon pea and the sun hemp, really good phosphorus right up there with the three sisters. One thing I would say is that the three sisters looks every bit as good as everything else. And then this is our new one, uh, faba beans with germ wheat. Um, it was supposed to be just a companion, turned out to be a polycrop. Um, the faba beans grew so well and they did ripen the same time as the, the durum. So we harvested them together. Um, if you want more information on this, Lana Shaw. Lana Shaw is fabulous. Lana Shaw it runs the Applied Research Farm and has, works with Derek all the time and is really promoting. She's on Twitter. She has, they have a great website on how to do a lot of the um, polyculture. Uh, she's a real expert on it. And, and also, she's a very good speaker. <coughs> Um, cover cropping. So we talked about polycropping, we talked about companion cropping. Now we're going to talk about cover cropping. And we can say the same thing for companions here. So I don't really separate them except that a lot of times the cover crop can be used as a forage crop and then I can go into something else. I'm trying to talk about landscape and all these different places where we work and where we live. And sometimes it's just not feasible to do some things that other people can do just isn't. But there's always some way we can adapt it. And I look at it like that. OK, this is what we got. Let's use what we got more efficiently, effectively, and optimize it. We don't have to do big, massive change. Just use what we got better. So this is an experiment that I did. This is my very first cover crumbing experiment. These are all the mixtures I can use. You see, I wasn't very. Um, I wasn't very uh, diverse, um, but this was when I was at Ag Canada and I was pushing boundaries in a big way. Um, so I couldn't get too fancy because they were all like, you're crazy, Jill, this won't work. Um, yeah, but what's new? Um, that's what my collaborator who I work with the tracer on, he's an atomic physicist. I goes, yeah, I was like crazy. He said, well, so why is that new? We all know you're crazy. Um, Sorghum Sudan, buckwheat and clover, woolly pod vetch and oats. Um, this was pretty amazing. And this was on eight inches of rainfall. In an eight inch rainfall zone, it was actually grown on six. But the thing, these are all my mixes here. But what I was trying to do was get to the one, one on one. So for every pound of cover crop I grew, I had one pound of nitrogen. That's pretty much what I was trying to do. Um, and I'll go back to the mixes here. And nine is subclover, sorghum, sudan, and buckwheat, which you see there, which you see did one, on, one for one. Then I grew wheat the year after. And here I am. And I'm looking at mineral density. And it's real. I changed it by growing something, a mix of crops beforehand and prove to myself and to everyone else that this can be done. What you grow, your sequence of crops, what you grow with them and everything can change your mineral nutrient density. And I don't, and then you look, I didn't have to give up yield. 
Not at all. In fact, the ones that I had big cover crops on before in an 8-inch rainfall zone where most people would grow fallow, I actually had really good crops. There's nothing wrong with a 67 bushel wheat crop that's 15% protein. Phosphorus. I like this. This is William Albrecht. Phosphorus is an organic nutrient. Everybody thinks about rock phosphorus and they think that it's just some kind of element, but it's not. It's organic. And we are, it's not just about inorganic cations, it's actually about using it organically, putting that phosphorus into the plant body, using it as an organic amendment. Genetics matter more and more. Here we are. This is actually, these are means of uh, 500 different ascension, uh, but accessions. But what I want you to see is we can pick. We're not always picking. We're not asking our breeders to pick for nutrient density, but we could. Barbara said this beautifully. We're not in a food, everybody talks about, well, how are we going to grow all this food? So Jim Robb, who's a farmer in southern Kansas, um, he did these calculations. He calculated how many people, 9 billion people, and he projected two pounds of corn for every person per day for a year. And he could supply that just out of his county in Kansas. Are we really in a shortage? We have political problems. I'm not going to stand on that soapbox. But um, it's about distribution. It is not about productivity. Um, zinc and food quality. I work a lot on zinc. My grad students work on zinc and selenium. Um, what we're showing is that we need to put more zinc in our foods. Um, zinc drives everything. It drives, if you're anemic, it, dry, it opens, it, it, it allows the, the gate opening so that iron can come into your bloodstream or stay out when you have an infection. You want to be paying attention to zinc. It's really super involved in, in inflammation and all this. So let's work on zinc. Let's work on getting these micronutrients in there so that we don't have some of these diseases. And that film was beautiful, really, about nutrition. And when I watched the film on cancer and, and the, um, grazer, the, the diet, the grazer's diet, it was like potassium and micronutrients, I mean, and beta carotene, I mean, and how to fight diseases. We know that. More nitrogen. No, not more nitrogen. More nitrogen builds fake protein, but it's about the quality of the protein. What are the amino acids that are in there? What are the carbohydrates? If I have fewer carbohydrates, then I don't have as much vitamin C. How good is that? I don't have as much inulin. Inulin is so important in colon cancer, and wheat is the most important source of inulin, and one of the best things to stimulate microorganisms in your gut if you don't have celiacs. And let's do this. And ammonium sulfate, just a little bit of ammonium sulfate. Keeping your sulfur up will build your B vitamins. So let's get that sulfur in there. You know, we talked about climate change. People have talked about climate change a little bit. When I did my PhD, and I finished in 1992, um, I was working on sulfur dioxide air pollution, mycorrhizas, and carbon transport. We don't have that problem anymore. We have no acid rain, and people have to use sulfur. Do you know that there's two generations before you that never used sulfur? Because they didn't have to, because it rained out of the sky all the time. Now, all of a sudden, we have all these farms that are sulfur deficient, and they're going, well, how could I possibly be sulfur deficient? I've been sulfur deficient for like 30 years. And you're like, yeah, because you had acid rain, and now you don't. This is Bob Quinn Organics. Some of you will know um, Bob from Kaboot International, because he is the founder. Um, we did this little study where we looked at all these varieties. We looked at old varieties, new varieties. And what we can tell you is that none of them are the same. Grown in the same soil under exactly the same conditions, they take up different nutrients. So one of the things Bob and I have talked about is mixing all these varieties together, growing them all together, and then having the perfect blend. So, food pharmacy. I'm going to finish with food. Um, Wilma Chan and June Tester started food pharmacies in Oakland. It's progressed around California. Um, it's essentially like a CSA. 
and foods delivered to patients that are pre-diabetic. And they are prescribing it, and the really cool thing is California, their state-run health is actually paying for it. They talked them into it. So we are getting there. Drew Ramsey um, calls himself a nutritional psychiatrist, and Drew talks a lot about eating your way out of depression and prescribes food for people that are having problems with depression. He is also the kale diet man. He is all about kale. Every shirt he wears half the time is kale on it. Um, and we were teasing him about kale, but um, there are other food groups in there, but brassicas come up over and over again. Why? We talked about it. They put, they suck the nutrients into them, especially heavy metals, and that's what we're really trying to do. You've seen the tracers out there. I'm going to introduce something new. You'll see that this one here is actually scanning something. Um, this comes from the art world. So people have asked questions about the tracer. This is kind of an appendage to the end of it um, for how to measure these things. So we started in the art world. This is actually an elemental scan of Faisal here. We started because we can detect forgeries, because every master painter had their own colors that they blended from their own elements. Uh, yes, it's not surprising that they died early on, because they were all using a lot of arsenic, um, and they were using lead. Um, lead here is the blue color, gives a lot of the blue color with the arsenic. Yes, combine lead and arsenic. Um, but you can do it on leaves, too. So we're particularly interested in this one, chloride and potassium. You see the chloride's at the tip, and the potassium is surrounding the chloride. In bananas, some of you will know that bananas are in crisis right now. Um, we have two varieties of bananas, and both of them are being prone to disease, and we are struggling with banana decline. Um, I work a lot in Guatemala, and one thing we noticed is that when we were looking at the leaves, that they had these dead margins. And then when we used that tracer out there at the farm, all of a sudden the chloride came up at the edge of the margins. And they were, oh no, it's boron deficiency, boron deficiency. Like, no, this is actually chloride toxicity. Mm -hmm. um, and what's really cool is that they were always potassium deficient, and we all know that bananas are a really good source of potassium. But why were they potassium deficient? Because they, the plant was using the potassium to block the chloride from, from the plant so to keep it at the margins. So it wasn't using the potassium anymore except as a wall, protecting the rest of the plant. And now we've been able to scan and actually show that. What I thought was really cool here, this is the distribution of silicon. And then you can see phosphorus is always close to the veins. And this is just another view of it with a, um, and this is open source software that we're using right now called Cezanne. And we took that from the art world. So this is from the art world. We've been scanning paintings for a long time, scanning artifacts. That instrument out there is not new, but the application to agriculture is very new. Um, eggs, you can just like plop an egg on there. Um, feathers, things like that, and then find out how much sulfur they're in, because how many of you knew that um, Chicken feathers are mostly sulfur amino acids, cysteine and methionine. They are. Um, so sulfur is really important to chickens. How many elements does this have? From sodium to uranium. And then this is looking at potatoes, just comparing the skin on the inside and the outside. And um, I'm at the end here, but there are some really important people to thank. I work with a lot of farmers that put up with me, some researchers like Martin Entz, who um, I have worked with for years from the University of Manitoba, who is an amazing um, organic researcher. Um, and, and my grad students, um, Dr. Bruce Kaiser, who's an astroatomic physicist who keeps my tracer working and who challenges me all the time on my knowledge of the periodic table 
and um, how elements work and how all things are light. Um, when you're standing on the ground, you're just standing on this whole other city that has this amazing infrastructure and is always building. And it needs energy in order to build that infrastructure. And we need to allow it to have that infrastructure so we can take advantage of it. I and mean, I say advantage of it, but really so that we can work with it. So that we can be part of that system. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks for coming today. I really appreciate it.